And today we have a uh, special guest in my interview with Jim Richardson, the uh, National Geographic photographer. Um, we both share the same name and we're going to find out if we actually share some history together. I don't know. There's a small uh, fraternity of us around the world, isn't there? We got some good Jim Richardsons out there, so. Yeah, there's a, uh, I could, uh, I was always disturbed that I could not get JimRichardson.com because oh. there's the, 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 uh, the stand-up comedian who, t who uh, Oh, that's right. I yeah, think yeah, he's that... Canadian. He does, uh, he does workshops on stand-up comedy. You could just do a whole series of uh, a whole podcast. that's just Jim Richardson talking to Jim Richardson. You? I thought, you know, I thought maybe this will be the first one, you know? Yeah. So you came from like a background of like, um, you know, learning photography in, in college and, and you got into photojournalism. My photography background had gone back to the farm with my dad, who, uh, who was a truck driver and uh, was uh, picking up cameras at pawn shops uh, when he drove... Uh, hauled eggs to Texas from Kansas. And um, so I started out, you know, just photographing stuff around the farm and entering my pictures in the, in the county fair, um, uh, doing a, I actually did a, an odd job for my, uh, my uncle who was the chamber of commerce secretary. And that was, and, and that was my first paid job. Uh, I think he paid me 75%, 75 cents per picture. Um, and uh, he, uh, so by the time I got to college, I mean, I kind of knew my way around a dark room and things like that. That got me to a, a friend who worked at the student newspaper who wrangled me a job and uh, that stuck. And then I, uh, I stayed on there for a while and I, then I got an internship in Topeka, Kansas, which uh, unbeknownst to me at the time was the Mecca of uh, for young photographers uh, starting in journalism at the time. That would have been 1971. So it's been a while back, you know. You sent me a bunch of your uh, photography things. Of, I think that's from your town uh, in uh, Kansas, it's black and white. That town that you're looking at is Cuba, Kansas. An unfortunate naming happenstance uh, <laughs> that has nothing to do with Havana uh, that I started photographing 45 years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, it's a, just a small town, but that was one of the uh, the first things that I did that got any sort of attention and has been uh, one of the hallmarks of my photographic life uh, following what happened in that little town. I, I say little town, and I'm always amused when... when uh, when I see stories in the New York Times and they talk about small towns and they need a, they mean a place that has 75,000 people, you know, <laughs> I do go, no, that's not a small town. 3000 is kind of a small town. Uh, this is the town of 300. Yeah. yeah. Mary, Mary Krasny was this old, this old woman in uh, Cuba, Kansas, and she was just a delight. And she's coming in from her back, from her garden and, and her, and her kitchen door had that frosted glass pattern, you know, and she came up there and was just had her hand up there, you know, looking kind of looking through it, you know. Oh, she was over 80 at the time, but she was the kind of uh, person who could who could take out the graduation picture from 1917 and tell you all the stories. When she saw that picture, she said, she said, oh, she said, I love it. She says, it makes me look like the devil. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's it's great. You have all these, not just your photographs, but you have all the stories behind the photographs. Like, I've, done, I've done several books. I did a, story, a book on the Colorado River, which was really about resources. I did a book on uh, called High School USA, which was about three years in the life of, uh, of, adoles of adolescence in a small town high school. I will be doing a book of the Cuba, Kansas work. I'll be doing a book of Scotland. And uh, we'll see where it goes from there. My longevity with the National Geographic uh, largely came because I was well suited to doing the editorial work. Um, most of my stories, the majority of my stories, maybe 60 to 70% of them would be stories that I proposed. So you would always have a, a, a story proposal to start off with about what this story is about, you know. Uh, when the story is approved, then there would be a, a photographer assigned. And since I wrote it, I always hoped that <laughs> that I would be the one. There were fair, there were several cases in which I I wrote 
proposals that were approved uh, and then uh, then decided that that I had other things going on and I couldn't do them. So I basically gave them away to other photographers. But once a once a, a approval is done, then a, a team would be assigned. You would have a writer, a photographer, a picture editor, a text editor, a uh, map maker, um, a cartographer, uh, illustrator, if it needed illustrations, researchers, um, fact checkers, the, the whole the whole gamut. And uh, it would be the uh, the job of the photographer and the picture editor to develop the 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 shoot strategy of how you were going to cover this, come up with a budget and figure out where you're going to go and and what you're going to produce um, and how. Um, and, um, and then, and then go at it, you know, when you're all done and I'm, I'm, I'm glossing over a couple of extra steps here, but when you're all done, you go back to Washington and you would show it to the editors at that point, the editor would say yes or no, we're, we're, we're good to go. And then you, you would hand you over to the layout people and you go spend a couple of weeks in the layout room. Uh, doing the layouts and then you go back to the editors again and there's a room full of about 20 editors who you're telling this story to about why the layout is as it is as you propose and then you would see hopefully the ed the editor-in-chief would say yes or they would say um, let's think about this and then the, you know it'd get all torn up fortunately not there wasn't much tearing up on my stories uh, so that's that's one of the reasons why that whole process is 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 why I uh, did uh, well 35 years of work uh, for National Geographic. Uh, there are a few other, there are three or four other of us who had those kind of careers. Um, but it's all it's always that there is fundamentally that there is an idea that this story is about, and the photography is aimed at at implementing that idea. It is not. That you're going to go to the Grand Canyon and take pictures until you have some pretty pictures. <laughs> right, right. They they do have to be pretty pictures. They had they yeah. they have to they have to be page turners, Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I took along uh, the first of the Nikon digital SLRs, a D100, and six megapixels. Everybody would turn up their noses at six megapixels these days, you know. Um, and I saw what it could do, and and I vowed. Instantly, I mean, as soon as I started seeing those files on screen, I said, "Okay, I'm done with film. That's the last story I'm shooting on film. It could be digital from now on, period." And uh, and thankfully, I did because because those digital files are now worth way more than the old film files because of uh, the reproduction of it um, and the usefulness of it. So uh, no, it was kind of like okay. We're out of here. Anybody who's actually struggled with film in in the business of having to do a job, you know, agrees with me. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are nostalgic for Kodachrome, I, I can just say, you never really worked at it very much, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is, and you know, back in the day, what did you have? Twenty four or thirty six exposures, and then and you, we would and we would shoot for a story. We would shoot a thousand rolls of film, right? So you so you'd shoot thirty five to forty thousand pictures, you know, that you had to go through all, all of them coming out thirty six at a time in in yellow boxes. You know, so it took, took a long time to do editing. But but the big transition, Jim, for, for digital is it opened up another half of the world. The night, photographers beginning today have no concept of how much larger the available world is to them to photograph than, than what it was for us with film. You mentioned night photography. Did you compose that? Yeah, that was down at... Uh, Natural Bridges National Monument. That story came out in about, came, see, we started that in about 2008. By then, digital cameras had gotten to the place that, that you could do the, the Milky Way exposure in a short enough time that the stars would move. So you could do a landscape without the Milky Way moving, which basically comes down to about a 30 second exposure uh, on a 14 millimeter lens. 
And that's, that's what I shot that on. That exposure that you're looking at is actually about 60 seconds and the stars do move a little bit uh, in there, but it still looks good, you know. And, and back then when I did that, there were about three of us in the United States who could pull off one of those pictures. And today, I mean, everybody's doing workshops of doing those things and everything. So it was important to be able to do that because we had to show for, for a story on light pollution, what was being lost, you see. And even then you could say, that roughly 80% of the children born today will never see the Milky Way. It's just tragic. Uh, I, I know I have met people in our shop. A guy came in from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he looks at this picture that you're looking at, and he says, what's that? And I said, the Milky Way. And he said, what's that? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, yeah. I mean, isn't that kind of a tragedy? Yeah, you know, that yeah. It's, it's, it's like never being able to see fireflies at night, you know? Yeah. You had another photograph I noticed of a person that looked like they were in the Arctic and they were holding some sort of vial. That's Kerry Fowler. He's the guy who proposed and developed uh, that seed bank. And he's up there holding sealed glass tubes of seeds. What you're seeing there is the uh, Svalbard seed bank. It's up in Svalbard, which is this frozen island up there in the, in the Arctic, where they, they dug a hole in the mountainside and put three rooms back in there so that they could take backup copies, just like you back up your computer, backup copies of those seeds up to the Arctic, and they put them in that frozen mountainside. And if the power goes out, they'd still be good for two years. So that was the opening picture of our story about that. And you're up against Cleopatra on the cover of National Geographic, and you have to make a, a page turner picture out of this stuff, you know? So, so when I found out that he would be in the Arctic and I could go up there, you know, I mean, it was damn expensive doing that picture. I went up there for four days, flight, you know, two flights to get up to Svalbard, you know, we probably spent about $10,000 to do that picture. But it was worth it. I mean, it was a central picture to the, to the, uh, to the story and, uh, and, and great fun to do. And I got to go up and hang out with Kerry Fowler. You know? oh. Fascinating, fascinating guy. He's made something happen in the world. You know, so Their book about the whole project called Seeds on Ice, about half the pictures in the book are mine. So I also kind of got to got contribute to this worldwide phenomenon in a, in a sort of, a, well, an obscure left-handed sort of way. I was in Dalhwini up in the Highlands and there were two Highland cattle there inside a, uh, behind a fence. And I had gotten out of my car and I had my, my camera on my tripod. I'm looking through the lens at Rusty and Tufty that was the names of the two, two Highland cattle, beautiful animals. And as I'm looking through the lens, this guy in a leather jacket and a mohawk haircut walks into the frame. I mean, literally walks up to the cattle with a loaf of bread and feeds them a loaf of bread in about 30 seconds. And then he's gone. It's kind of like, whoa, well, that was about as lucky as you get, you know. I did a story inside of Fingal's Cave, cave of, uh, of basalt columns, you know, octagonal basalt, black basalt. And I, I puzzled on that for about six months of how the hell to do that, because I had been in it before. The problem with uh, basalt is it's black <laughs> and caves are dark. And, uh, and so I, I, I finally, uh, I was finally reading about Scotland and I saw this old Victorian etching of a Victorian party taking a boat back inside the cave and up at the front was a man holding a lantern. And that was a light bulb moment. And I thought, oh, I see, I, I need to light it. I need to light it from the inside. And I got a couple of guys to go out and we stayed on the island overnight and I got them each a million candle power flashlight. And they were, they were back in the back inside the cave, lighting the thing up at 3.30 in the morning on a five minute exposure. So you could say, you know, it took, uh, it took five minutes for the exposure, but it took six months for the light bulb to go off. Right. right. <laughs> it like looks it. really spooky, too. It looks like fog or, or something at the... No, it's kind of mist in the air from uh, from the yeah. water, waves coming in and out. You kind of wow. want to, you don't want to do it at high tide. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Everybody in the Victorian era went out there. Uh, J.M.W. Turner painted it, and uh, Wordsworth wrote a poem about it, and Felix Mendelssohn wrote an overture called well, The Hebrides, uh, or kind of known now as Fingal's Cave. And um, But I don't know that anybody else has ever lit it. And what about the one here I'm looking at with the uh, cliff? So I basically, I, what I did was I hired a boat, could just take me out there and keep and stay with me uh, for sunset. And uh, I spent about $2,500 on the boat. And we got out there and it was it was totally socked in, in clouds. Couldn't see a thing. And <laughs> I just going, oh, no. oh yeah, <laughs> oh. But we came, went around the island. And we, when we came around, the sun came out for a few minutes and lit up the cliff face. And those tens of thousands of gannets, those are gannets, mm -hmm. started flying out to meet us. And it, yeah, that was an incredible scene. Uh, you don't you don't get those scenes all the time. And no no Photoshop here, right? No, we're pretty much uh, we're pretty much in the nonfiction business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And I'm looking at some other ones here. It looks like kind of like it's not Stonehenge, I don't think. It's like a stone circle with all the different stones. That's Callanish. That's out on the Isle of Lewis. Next to Stonehenge, that's about the, the, the biggest of the stone circles. It's, uh, it's about 5,000 years old. But what you're seeing there was uh, I stayed there overnight and, and I was lighting it, sometimes with my flash unit and sometimes with a little flashlight that I carry in my, uh, in my bag. So that was a 30 second exposure. And during that exposure, what I did was I would, I would go up and I would light a couple of the, 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 uh, the stones on the side. And then I would run and hide behind one stone and light the center stone. And then I'd run over and hide behind the center stone and light the stones back behind it. And then in about the last seven or eight seconds of the 30 seconds, I would turn around and shine the flashlight back towards the camera from behind the stone so that lit the grass. You see the grass is kind of lit yeah, and green there. Yeah. yeah. So that's all just me out there with a little flashlight during a 30 second exposure lighting it about 3.30 uh -huh. in the morning. So here's one, I'm, I'm uh, it's a, looks like a small, I don't know if it's a small leatherback or, or a large leatherback turtle yeah. beach. Yeah, that was for the um, light pollution story. And, and oh. that was one of the impacts of light pollution on uh, some species. That's about the, that, you know, those, those hens, the, the, the females would come back and they, they would nest within about 100 yards of wherever they were hatched. And they come back and all of a sudden there's a high rise tower built behind them with lights on them. And yeah. the, 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 the impact comes from the fact that the, the little turtles crawl out and they go towards the light. Yeah, they go towards <laughs> yeah. the light and they get run over on the roads back there. Yeah, that is Lawrence of McEwen. He is, he is the Laird. He's the Laird of Muck, the Isle of Muck. Four miles long and two and a half miles wide that, uh, that he owns it. And uh, I wanted to have him up there because one, he has his great face. And two, I wanted the scene, the islands in the background, the surround, the, the sea around him and all that. And it was just blowing up a gale. I was in a panic because I couldn't figure out what picture to do. I, I had huh. all the stuff, had all the stuff in front of me and I can't figure out what the right picture is, you know? And he was leaning in there trying to get out of the wind and his dog came over and then he, and then he looked at me and so, uh, it, it all came together. One of the key talents is getting yourself in front of the, the good subject. You know, if I, if, I have, if I had two weeks of wandering around Scotland, you know, taking pictures, or I could get 15 minutes with Lawrence McEwen atop the Isle of Muck with his dog, I'll take the 15 minutes. <laughs> right right if i can get to the right if i can get in front of the right thing right it makes a hell of a difference yeah and that's why i went i saw his face and i thought okay laird of muck okay i'm going there we're <laughs> gonna make a picture out of this somehow i don't know how but uh <clears throat> but that business of getting yourself there and getting yourself uh, uh in front of it you have the three uh horses on the beach here Walking along, which is a really Lauren, Lawrence's horses, yeah. Oh, those is his horses. Okay. 
And so, yeah, the horses just wander around and, uh, and they were really friendly. And uh, yeah, there were two or three really nice pictures came out of uh, spending a couple of days out there on muck. I was doing a story on soil and uh, I wanted a farm that looked like a farm. I mean, I wanted to, sort of the Norman Rockwell dream of what a farm should look like. Mm -hmm. So I had been there before and I had seen that. And I, so I, I got a hold of a, a pilot who could, that I learned from the pilot was that, is that you can do that, but you have to take off in the morning before the fog comes in. Right. So you have to take <laughs> off in the morning and then you wait for the fog to come in underneath you, you know, and then you have to have a, an emergency airport within, uh, you know, flying distance to get back down in case the fog doesn't go away. <laughs> but, yeah. And then the total opposite of this would be the Copper Canyon with just <laughs> all these insane yeah. people. <laughs> Where now? Yeah, it's a Memorial Day party. Yeah. It feels everybody comes out in their boats. It's a big drunk. Were you on top of another hill looking down at all this or? In the middle of Copper Canyon, there's a little island. And I had a guy bring me out there in a boat and drop me off on that island. And I went up on top of the... Uh, uh, the highest point there, and that's where I could get that vantage point on the Mississippi River story that's showing the, the effects of river management. Graveyard that was washing into the sea. And then that happens because of the management of the river with the building of the levees and they and they so that so, so that the, the it doesn't flood anymore and the silt doesn't get out there. And so then all this area is just gradually gradually going down in the water. And there was a graveyard out there that some po people pointed me towards of, uh, and, and graves were washing into the sea. Yeah. And, and then, then, then there was that nice thing that there was a sign that said, no wake, yeah. you know, which is the, do the double meaning, you know, what they really meant, you know, is, is you know, right. boats can't go more than 10 miles an hour yeah. or whatever, you know, yeah. But well, no it wake. has a very interesting, yeah, it's very right. nice, you know. <laughs> double meaning, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's out at Uig Bay. <clears throat> it's on the west coast of the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. Um, it's this big bay and it's, it's gorgeous. Um, uh, a mile across, uh, but shallow. And uh, it drains completely twice a day at low tide. So you, you can walk clear across. At low tide, oh. you can walk clear across. Uh, it was one of those places that, uh, oh, the Vikings would stop there. Mm -hmm. uh, on their on their route from Orkney around to the uh, to the islands and and off to Ireland, uh, that was a, an island stop. There's a place across the bay, are some sand dunes, and that's the place where the Lewis chessmen were lost a thousand years ago. They're beautifully done chess pieces carved out of uh, of, of whale bone, I think it was um, whale teeth probably. Um, some Viking lost them there a, a thousand years ago uh, in the sand dunes, and, and, they, and uh, they weren't found until about 1850 <laughs> wow. by, a, okay. by a local lad wandering yeah. around chasing the cows, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, that's a beautiful place. Yeah. Then, then you have a couple portraits I just want to get to. This is one with a looks like a woman from Peru or something, kind of staring up. That's Juana Valerio. Uh, she's a uh, she's a farmer in Peru. We're up at about fourteen thousand feet there, and that was on uh, the story on uh, on farmers uh, who grows our food. And you know, the amazing thing was was that I'm up there carrying about my twenty pound camera bag and huffing and puffing around. Juana, I saw her pick up a 70 kilo bag of potatoes. 70 kilos is over 140 pounds and carry it down a 45 degree slope. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no problem. Wonderful person, but uh, but tough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Burkina Faso and uh, Niger and what else is out there? Um, they always get rated, you know, in the in the bottom three or four poorest countries of the world. You know, and we were out doing the, uh, doing a story on soil. Uh, we had gone out there because there was a guy who's famous for planting trees out there, a guy named Yakaba Saodogu, that's his village. And um, I was there with the family in the morning. And uh, yeah, and this kid picks up this, this goat, you know, and it was just such a touching moment. But the whole scene too, I mean, the, they were there, this was breakfast before they were getting ready to go to school. 
He's holding it, the guy's over there on the right, the mother's over there looking back at them, the little boy poking his eyes out, you know. People tend to want to do portraits uh, with, with a soft out of focus background because well, it's simple. <laughs> It's easy to do. <laughs> you've only got one thing. You've got the face of the one person there. You know, when you try and do it with a wide angle lens like that, oh, all these things are going on. You know, and uh, and uh, you know, I had some frames that were, you know, where the woman's looking at me, and I, you know, and I'm, I'm just behind the camera going, look that way, look over there, look <laughs> over there. You know, and the kid sticks his head out. You know, and you've got all these things happening. You know, and you're trying to to juggle them all and, uh, and as you move around just in little bits and pieces, you know, the scale of the guy on the right changes and do you include the door of the kitchen or not? And all those kind of things are happening very quickly, you know, and it's just, it, and I'm aware that I'm in front of something really cool, really fascinating. And I, and I just have this panic feeling of, I, I want to get this. You know, uh, you don't get these chances all the time. You, you don't. Uh, so when they when they come about, uh, there's a very great sense that, you know, just you want to say to yourself, Jim, don't don't screw it up. You know, don't 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 make your usual mistakes. You know, uh, yeah. these people are giving something to you. They're giving something to you and the rest of the world by letting you into their lives and letting you see this, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, do it right. I mean, you really can get a sense of the, the culture and like what's happening there. Yeah. Just you know, can you uh, interaction? You know, can you see on the on the wall back behind him and on the window there? There's some metal and some writing on it. They've been doing their homework on the window. Oh my gosh! Wow! It's like yeah, yeah. It's like I, it's like I seven just, times eight is fifty six stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. there it is. It's a, you know, that's the one thing, like you said, it's it's good to hear it from a photographer who knows that it's not all about just, oh, well, I have the right camera. And well, you got, you got to do that, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's not just about that. Some people think, no. well, if yeah. I had a camera like that, I could take these pictures, you know. A lot, a lot of people do. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, the other thing is, though, Jim, is... A lot of people do do a lot of great pictures today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you just have to get on Instagram and you'll yeah. see that, that there are so many people doing wonderful images these days. Yes, there are, you know, it's become a language. You know? So it's really quite marvelous. Don't you have like a gallery or something that you're, you yeah. work at or something or? We have a gallery across the street from our apartment uh, and uh, and that's where I have my archive and do all my printing because I print all of my own photographs when I sell, uh, when I sell fine art prints and do the production of the shows where my lectures and, and things like this. Somebody calls up and says, oh, do you have any pictures of, of uh, children in Africa with their animals? You know? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, or something like that. Um, so uh, all, all of those kind of things, but um, that's a normal part of being a photographer these days. Um, even even when I was was say working really for what you would call full time for National Geographic, you you could count as maybe uh, if you could if you could spend ten percent of your time actually out in the field with a camera. That was a lot. Hmm. It's not out there every day be taking taking pictures. No. It's not, it's not that. There's way too much preparation, way too much getting use of into it. And also just paying the bills by making sure that the pictures get out there in the hands of somebody who will pay you to use them. Yes. Hmm, okay. Do you have a website that uh, you want to let people know? Oh, yes. You can. Uh, there's a couple of things. You can go to jimrichardsonphotography.com to see a lot of my pictures, probably some of the things you're looking at there are, are some of those things, jimrichardsonphotography.com. And then our gallery is smallworldgallery.net. And there you will find my fine art photography and cards and posters and all that kind of stuff, as well as the, my wife's jewelry. We used to say people came into Small World Gallery to see my photographs. And then they started coming into Small World Gallery to see my photographs, and then they would buy Kathy's jewelry. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Now they just come in for the jewelry, you know? So <laughs> I know where I stand in this whole thing. <laughs> it was great to have you on uh, Anime. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This has been yeah, fun. Thank no, you. It was great to finally meet you and uh, hear some stories about your photography and well, I'll be, thank you so much for having me, uh, and it's been de it's been delightful to have this time to talk about these things. Thanks for for giving me a a, a bit of a, a soapbox to get up on on uh, on on some of these uh, some of these issues, and uh, and it's always it's always uh, it, it it feels good when the pictures get out and somebody gets something out of them, somebody enjoys them or benefits in some way or another. So thanks for that opportunity. But great talking to you. Very good. All right. I hope we'll meet again. Yes. Yeah. I'll send you a link to this when it's done. And you please know. do. Okay. All right. Well, nice meeting you. And thanks again. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Well, there you have it. Uh, that was Jim Richardson, the National Geographic photographer. I want to thank him for coming by and talking about what he's done and what he's doing. And uh, also, if you are a Jim Richardson and would like to be interviewed by Jim Richardson, please contact Jim Richardson at heyjimr at gmail.com. If you aren't a subscriber, please subscribe. Just press that little button right there. I also have some other videos right over here's one, and uh, this is pretty good too. So uh, please become a subscriber. Remember the 500th or the 1000th thousandth subscriber will win a special prize. So uh, thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time on Animated Education.